Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first ever match they attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm actually thrilled to say that today's guest is Martin Tyler, the doyen of football commentary, who barely needs an introduction, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, Martin spent his early years actually back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, actually, at ITV, before moving to what was BSB and then quickly became Sky. And he's been the voice of the Premier League since its inception in 1992. Somehow he's also found time to be first team coach at a series of clubs and is currently the first team coach at Hemel Hempstead. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go straight to the nub of this um, podcast, Martin. And I believe you have pretty clear memories of your first match, which puts you in an unusual bracket because some of the people I've had on here don't really have any idea what happened, but they do know what happened around it. So let, let's start with that first match. Well, it was Woking against Kingstonian in December, just before Christmas, December 1953. I was eight. And I had been to the odd other sporting event and my grandfather on my dad's side took me to Lords for the 1953 test match. Um, when Lindsay Hassett got a hundred and I think I saw one wicket taken by England on the day, <laughs> but I do yeah. remember sitting on the grass. They let us sit on the grass. Uh, by the boards. It was lovely. So I, sport was in my blood. I had sport on my mother's side with cricket as well and hockey, one of my, Great uncles played hockey for England, um, but no football. Um, but the next door family, and we were living in a street which is um, now much better known because they built a school at the end of it called Fulbright School, where a few sporting uh, people have come through. And uh, Shah Bashir, the cricketer, has just been to India. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's the latest one, I think. Um, oh. And uh, But it wasn't there then. It was built actually while we were there. Um, and you could back down a side road to um, a bus stop where you could get a bus, as I found out, straight to working for Now uh, I wouldn't have known that, but the next door family with six children, how they squeeze them with their little bungalows, they're still the same. You want to go and have a look? I'll go, I'll go and check it out. <laughs> Selston Road, New Hall. I think we were in 21. And um, then uh, one of these next to the white family um, came we were messing about together I suppose as kids do they said do you want to go to football on Saturday well, what do you mean said, well we can go to working I went yeah that sounds great uh, so gate money for my mum and dad and there's an 8 year old with an 11 year old probably maybe 12 mm-hmm. trundled off got the bus straight to the ground into the ground, which is exactly where it was now, where it was then, and um, had a great, um, a great time working one four one. It was an enchanting experience, and I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say it shaped my life. Mm-hmm. So it was immediately it captured your attention, captured your imagination, and then your basically your life in football. That was the platform from where it came. Yeah, I was a fan first, then a player, and and commentator, and then, as you know, during the commentary period, I got inveigled back into non-league football by a good friend of mine, Alan Dowson, who's responsible for everything that managed in non-league football. Um, and uh, so, yes, I think it's. I look back on it and because I remember it so well. I think it must have had a really vivid impact on me. I remember getting my first football around that time and it was Christmas Day. It was confiscated before Christmas lunch. Like <laughs> Would lunch. you smash a window, Martin? Or what no, I, I was definitely a threat to smash a window. <laughs> <laughs> and it was indoor in the house where I was told to go outside, but I seem to remember it was either snowing or raining or something. Right. Um, but, yeah, there was, there was always something uh, about a ball, you know, I, um, I played cricket quite a bit. I had to play rugby at school. I didn't like it, but I had to play it. 
uh, and generally but the football is something that I don't know just made an impact on me and I tried to make an impact with it <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it's um it, yeah it, it was special and working football club remains special only last Friday I was hosting an evening there with Glenn Hoddle um which we were one or two of my generation who remember the good times and we were building a very good team in 1953. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize at the time, but in the August, they'd signed the Mortimer brothers who had been playing for Aldershot, but as amateurs, because this was the era when there was a separation between professionals and amateurs. So if you played league football, you couldn't come and play for working in the SME league. You got paid. Charlie and John were of Corinthian spirits, really. And they were superb players. John was a, what we call a wing half in those days. And after, I think it was the 56, 57 season, signed for Chelsea, played over 270 games for Chelsea, mostly as a centre half. And had an outstanding professional career, went on to manage Benfica, no less. Wow. So he was, he was somebody who was, um, obviously, Woking were lucky to have them both passing through, but Charlie stayed. Uh, Charlie actually played one game in 1968, I think, but he coached the side. He scored 250 goals, record goal scorer in uh, around 360 games. He was, um, he wasn't a big striker. He was a clever striker. Um, in the system, in the old WM formation, you know, but he was the n number yeah. nine. He scored in the game. Um, and I don't know how that happened. The one thing I can remember from the team is they had a left winger, well, you had a left winger who scored, who scored in the game called Freddie Pink. I thought mm -hmm. that was a, a cute name to have. I hadn't come across many people before or since whose surname is Pink. I apologize. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but it just stuck in my, my consciousness. It sounds like a character in a spy novel, so the Jean Le Carré, Freddie Pink, moving yes. around parts yeah. of East Germany. No one knows what he's up to. I think it was some espionage, I think, Stoney in that day. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was the Amateur Cup. It was unusually, I don't know, I check this out, but it was the first round proper, which is normally played in January. Right. The time it was played on, I think, 18th or 19th of December. Um, and yeah, working got through. They've been knocked out of the FA Cup by Kingstonian in September. And they played home and away in the league and both away teams won the games. And then there was a local cup in which they met for a fifth time at the end of the season. So I think Woking had two wins to Kingstonian's three. So I was lucky to go on a good day. But what I must say, Richard, and this I think was also a very good lesson in life. I went back a couple of weeks later for my second year, same route, same companion, and working lost 4-1 oh. to Wimbledon, right. who were um, in the process of... You, you, I know you like to talk about local rivals. I mean, Kingston is very close mm -hmm. and uh, to Woking in Kingston, and Wimbledon, obviously, just across the other side of the A3. So um, I think they were rivals. Wimbledon became a very big rival because they started to poach players away from other clubs, not just Woking. But Woking maintained their amateurism, I think, until probably late 60s. Um, yeah. And they were one of the few clubs. The Corinthian Casuals, who I played for, were the only club to not to play. Um, I think Clapton were another one that went almost a distance, Dulwich Hamlet maybe, and um, but it, it, the FA realised what was going on, and in the early seventies they changed it, um, and therefore professionals could come and play for clubs like Woking, and everything was instead of being money stuck stuck in a brown envelope in your boot, which actually did happen. <laughs> yeah, it was um, it, it was all tax deductible and properly administered, and, and the game certainly been a lot better for that. Yeah. And as you say, that was the FA Amateur Cup. And uh, I think I'm right in saying, I looked it up, there were about 3,000 people mm. at Kingfield that day. Could you give me just a little bit of, could you give us just a little bit of idea of the ground? Because 
I've seen a couple of photographs and there's just, there seems to be a rope around the pitch and then the fans are behind the rope. So was that how it is? You just stacked up and, you know, managed to get sight line wherever you might be? Um, I went back and did a 70-year piece not that long ago, the anniversary. And um, I, my recollection was of a railing. Um, the stands on the dressing room side, the dressing rooms have been improved. Mm-hmm. As I know from my time, because amazingly, I end up coaching at Woking yeah. when I was eight, and I got on the team photo when I was seventy-three. <laughs> um, Just a sixty-five-year gap is fine. So that's, that's a journey and a half, isn't it? And of course, yeah. I coached only for six years prior to that. Um, so it's all been very interwoven. Um, uh, but I and I painted the stands in my teenage years. Oh, really? Asked okay. for volunteers. My dad was an ironmonger. We had an ironmonger shop in West Bife, which is mm-hmm. one stop on the train line from working. And um, he, my brother, who was younger than me, had inherited all the skills, all the DIY skills, anything you could fix. I was the complete opposite. So the thought of me going to paint anything was greeted with horror by my family. It's quite a good tactic. I would recommend it. If you say you're hopeless, they don't ask you in the end. I got away with quite yeah. a lot of it through that. Yeah, I, I've actually used that myself. And, you know, generally my wife mends the plugs because she knows that I'm going to make an absolute haulix of it. But, but don't tell her that, for goodness sake. <laughs> um, but there was me with a pin of paint and a big brush slapping it onto the stand, which is still there. And I... I did say the other night, I said, I think that's the same paint. That would be, well, it was after the, it was in the lead up to the terrible winter. So that would have been 60 years, 10 years later. Yeah. Because we got given a prize, which was to go, it was 62, because we were given a prize in 63 to go with the team on an amateur cup trip, Gloucestershire, in which we left working at 7 a.m., I saw one of the players the other day, he's still around. He said we were digging it out of the snow um, by 10 a.m. on the A4. We got there too late to play. We stayed overnight in Cheltenham and got home at four in the afternoon, having not seen a ball kicked. And the game was right. played eight. The game was played eight, which was always the priority fixture where they always kept the cup. We had to play the cup game. So the, the cup game, if it was not finished, not played, you had to play that as your next game. It was finally played at the end of February, from the beginning of January. So it was a, it was a terrible winter. That that was that was part part of my involvement, um, all stemming from going um, to that first game. So the ground was pretty tin pot. There was, I think, a rope on the far side. There was another pitch on the far side, which meant if the kickoffs were different, you could trundle around to the other side of the ground and watch the third team we usually play. They were called the Woking Strollers. And but a lot of the young talent, and it was a very um, woking Surrey based group of players. If somebody came from London to play, it was quite a shock. You know, I, yeah. I would go by train from my lit near the uh, near the station at West Byfleet and uh, uh, to Woking, and I and meet up sometimes. I meet on the train London based players. Who, mm-hmm. uh, I would never ask for a lift in their taxi to the ground. It's far too shy, and I wanted to walk anyway. So um, we, um, yeah, and so you, and there was a hockey. I don't know what the hockey pitch was there then. I think it it was. Um, there was a hockey club played sort of further down. It's now all industrial buildings. I think one's at David Lloyd Centre. Um, but it was a very very sad day when the um, when the the other pitch, the other football pitch, was taken. Because they had um, a great um, five-a-side competition on Good Friday. Here we are speaking. The yeah. events. Um, and I went to watch it as a kid, played in it, and mourned the end of it, really. But we, 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 they split the pitches up into halves, and of course we had two pitches. So there was lots of scope for playing at junior, senior, intermediate, all those different levels. It was a great day of football. It was a great day of football. Um, and a lot of working first team players did um, they did uh, get seen for the first time, I guess, in, in that. And working entered the team into it. Mm-hmm. So um so yeah, it was a wide open space. 
now there's a very, very big stand behind the right hand goal if you come out and change your route. That wasn't there then, it was a, a bit of a chicken run. Yeah. And I think where the, they call it Mona's Corner, where I went, I, I wasn't <laughs> moaning. It's still got cool. Yeah, it's the underground. It's got a Mona's Corner cafe as well. I'm talk about advertising your wares, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think I, it was sort of there. My angle, I know that the angle was, was midway between the halfway line and the penalty area at the right hand. So, and yeah, I just, I just fell in love with it. And he, I know you, in to trigger it off, but uh, Woking's red and white half shirts was what really caught my eye. And Kingstonian have a very terrific um, baseball kit, still the same. Of course, they didn't wear it that day. It's red and white hoops, yeah. like Rangers, but red and white. And then um, the Woking have the halves like Blackburn Rovers. But, but, and that to me was, it seemed unique. I followed it. Some extent, I don't think I'd seen too much. Really, the television didn't offer very much in those days. But um, mm. I love that kit, and it was a big heartbreak to me when they went to an all red shirt in the seventies. Really, I was really disappointed, and um, I got um, I got asked to go to. I didn't get. I was going to go anyway, but I got asked to be on Sky when they broadcast. The, and um, Woking went back to Wembley in the 90s three times, mm -hmm. won three yeah. times, played trophy, which was the extension of the amateur the, the yeah. trophy. And they wore red and white halves for the first time for ages. Oh, really? I, I said afterwards, I got interviewed afterwards by this guy. I didn't do the commentary. I, I don't know. Well, I could have done it. I, I've done some Woking games. Too. Mm -hmm. But... Um, mm -hmm. I said, where's the red and white house? And I think it's now in the constitution of the club that you have to have red and white house. In 2004, I played a reserve game. Glenn Cockerell, who was a, a wonderful and long career in the football league, was manager of working in the good And uh, he said, look, I, I used to go and train with him. I said, would you like to come on in a first team game? And I, no, I'm a fan. <laughs> Wow. It was it was sparked by John Ryan of Doncaster Rovers, who did just that in a National League game. He was the chairman of Doncaster Rovers. I gather he got a pretty hostile reception position. And yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I can't guarantee that. So I said, no, no. I said, um, no. He said, that, that would be taking the mickey. And there's no way I want to do that. Mm -hmm. so he phoned me up another day and said, we're struggling for the reserve team, last game of the season. And um, can, can you come and be sub for that? I said, oh, that's fine. Where is it? It's a home. Great. Um, I had played against Woking in, in the interim, but so I played on the pitch before. And um, I went, so I went to the game and I thought, sub, and he gave me the number nine shirt and said, go on, if you go. Well, Harrow Borough Reserves. We won three 0 I didn't score much to my chagrin. I didn't get a chance, I don't think. But I did. There were the two centre halves marking me were eighteen and seventeen years old, and I was fifty eight. Okay, and, and it, it was a massive thrill. But the one thing that wasn't a thrill is we didn't wear red and white halves. We were wearing an old kit, like Arsenal's kit, red shirts, and white mm -hmm. I've got some photos of me playing in the game, but it doesn't really trigger anything for me because we didn't play the red and white halves. Reserve team kit, you know, first team kit. So we didn't get the first team kit. And um, so that was the only disappointment. Joe Cole was watching, in which um, I challenged him. <laughs> okay. He had a friend who played for Harrow Borough Reserves. Got you. So, yes, so it's, it's been a great working experience. So I, so I did play against them for Corinthian Casuals in 1971. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, at the Glen Hoddle evening, uh, only Friday week, yeah. I am, um, or last Friday, I am, um, I met the, one of the defenders who marked me in the game. No way. Yeah. Wow. I called Brian Finn, and I can remember saying he played. 600 games for working. Well, 
I said to him, when I played against you, I kept saying to you, I used to watch you as a kid, so you must be too old. It was just typical. Yeah. Trying to get an advantage. I didn't swear. <laughs> no, good. And, uh, and um, bless him, I said to him, I played against you. Think of all the games he played. And he went, I played against you. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't know whether he was just being nice, but it was... Uh, I think I did enough in the game to be member. I didn't run him ragged or anything like that. But it was a lovely moment, and those things keep coming around. And you know, it's because um, I'm in the locality. And uh, uh, uh. yeah, and it, <clears throat> as you say, kit is one of the things I think that most people. That's one of the things that's seared into their brains is the kit, uh, and as you point out, you're slightly dismayed when they change the kit and let's face it nowadays they change the kit almost to have a summer kit and a winter kit because you know there are certain other pressures to keep having different kits yes yeah, so they, they they've changed it a few times Rich, with but with the red and white are still there okay so, so there is scope within that um and for the nationally commentators it's great to say they haven't got red and white hearts on the back because otherwise, yeah. the black numbers would be difficult to decipher. Yeah. So they've got a nice sort of plain red numbers on the back. So I, I support that. But as long as it looks right when they're running towards you, you know, it's yeah. good. And I've been a few times this season. They've got a new manager, Michael Doyle, who played for, with the station for commentary and horsemen and others. Oh, yeah. And he's, um, he's, they had a great season after we left. Um, um, 2022, 20, 20, um, finished in the top four in the playoff places, lost, lost in the playoffs, as we did at Dartford, actually, almost simultaneously. Right. And, um, and it didn't go so well this year. So they've had to dig themselves out of relegation position. They're still in that. Um, but they're fighting hard and they've had some very good results recently. So I think they'll be, be no danger of them getting relegated. That's good because um, one of my other recent guests is Guy Mowbray, who you'll know, and I think you'll know he's a York City fan. So he oh, he's, a, he's a Manchester City fan. I mean, honestly, no, he's no, got he's he is. Oh, I, I promise you, he's got a shirt with Mowbray fifty on the on the back of Manchester okay. City. He's a Manchester City fan. He gets to do Manchester City commentaries um, and with a passion. And I, this is what some people say this to me, Richard. They say, oh, you must have a Premier League team. Why? Yeah. When, I, when I started going to football, Premier League was almost 40 years away. So why do you have to have two teams? Mm. The guy does love York City. And I'm not going to describe it. He's a good mate. And uh, yeah, he yeah. won't mind me taking the mickey out of him here, I'm sure. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, he does go. And John Champion, another excellent commentator, is also a York City fan. And um, so it's good. Alan Parry at Wickham, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. He's grown up. That was my, my last game in the uh, in the Isthmian League, was away to Wickham or Lokes Park. And um, it, uh, I, I think it shows people that are involved. We, we, we aren't just obsessed by the Excellence of football. Football is excellent at the top level. Don't get me wrong. It's a privilege yeah. to go to games and describe them. Um, but the pyramid is the the greatest thing we have in English football. I totally believe that, and it should be protected at all costs. And I'm very disappointed. I know it's politics, and they're holding out, and this, that, and the other. But the Premier League should be big enough to recognise this. Unfortunately, most of the owners don't recognise it because they don't know about it. And there's probably not enough people left at the football clubs who can talk up for it. So I'm quite prepared to talk up for it and say, and get the deal done and keep the pyramid intact. I mean, my dad was a shopkeeper and he lost out when a big chain came into the village in West Byfley in the same shopping precinct and cut the prices and economies of scale, all that stuff, you know. So I saw it. The, the cruelty of it, if you like, firsthand. Um, of, no one's going to give handouts from 
massive supermarkets to small independent businesses. Um, and so I can, I understand the business point of view of the Premier League. That they've got to show some soul here and understand why we are and that it's the games specially created in this country. And I want, um, I want it to be protected. And uh, if we have to do that, um, because we can't support it ourselves, then, and they've got to do it. I absolutely agree with that. I was having the same conversation with Jim White, who I'm sure you know of Telegraph, just yesterday on this podcast. And it just strikes me that, you know, you look at the basic idea of a pyramid, the strength is the base of it. So the, the pinnacle is obviously what everyone looks at. But actually, if you didn't have a strong base, it would disappear or it would crumble. So football really needs to understand that. And I think we see the crowds you get at lower league games and it is amazing. And even national league and, you know, you go further down and I think everybody, any football fan should go to a couple of non-league matches a season just to get the feel for it because it is... And they're real, they're real fans. They cheer. Yeah. And sometimes you go... I was watching England the other night and I thought, oh, well, I started covering England a long time ago, but it seems yeah. to have much more of a volume of involvement from the crowd, you know? And, and I think people... Yeah, everybody who goes to a non-league game wants one side or the other to win. So... Yeah. It, Generate it generates noise, and I do, you know, I do hope this will be it will be sorted out. And as you say, if the base is moved, Brian Moore, the great Brian Moore, who was one of my predecessors, later had um, um, a, he was a director at Gillingham Football Club, yes, in the lower divisions, and he was on committees uh, talking about oh, we should go part time and this, that, and the other. And he said, I don't want that. He used to say, we'll get fat footballers. He said, I don't want to watch fat footballers. I think he's a bit unfair because our footballers now, but in, in those days, maybe non-league yeah. football was a bit more chubby, but I don't think so. I, I can't remember. I, I, I did fight back with him a couple of times, but I know what he meant. Uh, yeah. full -time, it, what he meant was we need full-time footballers. And, that's, yeah. and, and now in the National League, it's almost all full-time. Woking in our time there, Alan Dass and myself, we went full time, mm -hmm. and um, so I think it's um, it's beholden to those who have all the riches um, to sprinkle some of that stardust down to um, clubs that do provide. Um, there's so many loan deals going on. It would be we waste too much time in this podcast. If we were, he came from here, but for him, he wouldn't have done that. Even going yeah. back. You know, to Rio Ferdinand and Frank Lampard went off on loans, went away, boys came back, men, you know, that those mm -hmm. always said their managers and, and many a player has, has benefited from the pyramid system. You can't get, um, if you don't play in the Premier League team, you can't get men's football at Premier League clubs. Yeah. The, the development stage is just playing. 19-year-olds against 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds against 20-year-olds. The same players must have played against each other from eight years old all the way up all to way 20. Up, yeah. yeah. And they don't, and the results don't matter. We get players in non-league football on loan from um, um, high-level clubs mm -hmm. and, and they can't cut the mustard. They, they have no idea of the men's game, the physicality of it and what it means to win even in front of a crowd of 1,200. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. So going back to that first match, an immediate affinity, an immediate love of the club. And you, I assume you went fairly regularly after that, got on the 437 bus or whatever it was that took you to Kingfield. Um, but I'd also like to switch forward a little bit. So as you say, that was an FA Amateur Cup game. And then I know, because I actually interviewed for The Guardian a few years ago, that you then followed Woking in the 1958 Amateur Cup uh, run. And I, I think I'm right in saying you went to every match uh, and they went all the way to Wembley. So so talk to us a little bit about that. Because obviously five years, four or five years after your first match, this must have been, you know, 
you, you were getting very close to glory, and in fact, you tasted glory. And Ken Wilson home commentary on a Woking game. Yes, yeah, I, I, I did dig that out, the video, and I love his commentary. It is just, one of the things I'll say before you can get, is the bit where he says, um, Ilford are definitely second favourites here because of Woking's five forward players, four of them internationals. You're going, wow, that is quite impressive. Yes, and five forwards is pretty impressive, isn't it? I mean, yeah. and the guy who wasn't um, an international, John Hebden, scored two of the three goals. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw him a couple of years ago. He's still with us and uh, um, very modest about his achievements. The, um, yeah, by then I was living in West Byfleet, not in New Horse, so I went on the train. I was going to school in Guildford, which is beyond Woking, so I had a season ticket which allowed me to go to Woking and back for nothing because it covered weekends. You know, yeah. It was a seven-day week or whatever it was a month. So I could go. So it didn't cost me anything to go. And um, apart from the admission fee and the programs, I got a program from the a very crumpled one from the first game. Is, oh, wow. That is, is it? That's amazing. It's written as well. I don't think it was me who wrote it in. I can't. <laughs> and and how much did that set you back? Well, that was a oh, couple, uh, couple of D. Yeah, it doesn't actually have the price on it, I don't think. Um, yeah, at the most, I would have thought. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I had a bit more access to it. Um, it, it made every, I was trying to school in Guildford. Guildford had a Southern League club, which was the professional side of the non league. Um, uh, semi-professional mostly and Guildford were pretty good um, they had a big ground, Joseph's Road kind of 12,000 past it and all the, all the kids at school were Guildford fans so and Woking couldn't play could play Guildford in the local cup competitions but usually um, not to any great success although I took great delight in telling my Crinking Casuals manager, Mickey Stewart, father of Alec, who um, oh, yes, yes. is still he's 91 years old. He's a brilliant guy. Um, but we didn't always see eye to eye when I was his player and he was my manager. Right. But I remember working on, Hall they call it a Halloween horror show in the Surrey Advertiser, oh. Guildford City 2, Woking 3. And oh, wow. uh, so I went to school the next day full of vigour. Um, but Mickey missed a chance in the last minute. And because he was Mickey Stewart, I'd been to yeah. the Oval some Cricket. So I prodded him with that a few times, but it, it, it didn't win me many arguments, I don't think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it was... And, and most of the games... Well, n no games involved any great travelling. Um, they're at home to Averley, who I where I went last Saturday, actually, and who oh. Hem Hemel are playing tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and but they've got a different ground, but it uh, brought back memories. The, the Woking beat them at home uh, six six one, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the, the tough game was Hendon away, which um, was played in a s snow. The game it was, it was a miracle that the game was played, but we played in snow and frost. I made yeah. my debut on a frozen top at Carl Shorten, um, and I'm like, like Bambi on ice. I'm, I'm six foot three, and <laughs> yeah. mostly leg. And then it was a ridiculous thing to. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't have been picked, really. But anyway, that was that yeah. was that was a Boxing Day game as well. So, um, so this was, um, yeah. So the set tended away. We had special train. I, I seem to remember. I used to do that in non-league football in those days. We certainly had one for Wembley, I think, and one for the. Two semi finals mm -hmm. were at Fulham, draw, and Brentford, the old Griffin Park win. So, um, yeah, so I went to Hendon. Woking were brilliant. They, we had the classified papers in those days, mm -hmm. which you know, was a result papers. People don't know about that in London, outside of London, they might know a bit more about it because I think they survived a bit more in the north. Yeah. Pinkins, the Greenans. Greenans, yeah. Yeah. We had Star News and Standard. That was a <laughs> cry from the news vendors. So we got three versions of it. Wow. And in one of, one of the versions, Woking were given a 10 out of 10 for their um, wow. Which was, I thought, 
at the time was extremely good because Hendon they had a few amateur internationals. So that was a hurdle in the snow climb. Uh, and then at home to Hayes, five. Home to Finchley, three up, three two. Uh, oh. That was a woking relay. I've got, I've got some stats for you. In the 53, okay. the, 53 the season 53 54, which is my first season, played 28 games, scored 62 goals, conceded 60, finished mm. four. Kingstonian oh. played 28 games. Finished six in the end, sixty-seven goals for sixty-four. So it was the, the, there were some ridiculous scores. It was a six-nine, um, right. four sevens, and things. I mean, yeah. it, it was just the, 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 and, and defending wasn't. It's a bit like now, really. Nobody bothers defending now, so no, it's, and, they're all too busy trying to go up the pitch as an yeah, inverted fullback. It wasn't play from the back though that's for sure um no and you I only was, had two at the back didn't you You had two three five so you couldn't really yeah. put it between each other but well, one of the one of the wing halves played as a sort of center yeah. half that's how it, it worked out not this in um, not reinventing the wheel are you really um but it was it was wonderful to watch and there were goals of plenty and i'm sure that happened and that it was heart heart filled joy and heartbreak <laughs> to go yeah. along, you know, it was, it was desperate. So, um, so we got to the semi final, which had a real drama. It was at Fulham against Barnet, right? One of working and no subs this time, and one of working's best players, the centre half, Ken Turner, uh, had to stay at home in the morning, didn't come on the team bus, his wife was ill. And he tried to get to the ground and couldn't get through the crowds and couldn't be named on the team sheet. No subs. So the left wing, the left wing half went later at the back. It was, it was a bit of a, there's always somebody in the, in a, in a team, however successful, where there's a bit of humor around. And this mm -hmm. guy called Ernie Clasey played the game of his life. And working through an own goal, but away with a 1 1 draw. So a week later, we're on the train again, <laughs> special train from Woking, calling it West Byfleet. Well, didn't arrange that personally, but it was on the way. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have a chauffeur? Like... No, no, but one, one or two of the di Woking directors lived in West Byfleet, so they may have had something to do with it. And, um, and we won again, hairy, scary stuff, 3 2. Like it was at uh, the Finchley game, and so Woking could score, but clean sheets uh, hadn't had one really. Yeah. So we go to, we go to Wembley, and this is where I honestly believe this, which is where I did my first commentary. Right. I went. My dad, as I say, is a shopkeeper, so he and he didn't like football, he, so he never came with me. But um, my best mate's dad. I call Stan Smith, who played for Leighton Stone in the 1930s and had a real, he was very cynical. <laughs> he right. didn't play us off their mistakes very kindly, but um, okay. he, uh, he took me and Andy, his son, who was, and, and you know, and, uh, so I went with him and another family of uh, father and son who were all at the same Guildford Grammar School. Yeah. Uh, and so, so that, Woking are one up at half time and they've beaten Ilford, I think, in the league both times. So they were really strong favourites. Mm. And um, the second half comes out and, and they bombard Woking. And John Burley, who I saw only two weeks ago, was a goalkeeper who was like all Woking goalkeepers, is um, no protection. <laughs> Basically, on a hiding to nothing. Yeah, battered. But he, he played the best 20 minutes he ever played for Woking. Right. Uh, I, my friend Andy, couldn't, who was a year younger than me, he couldn't watch. So I'm telling him what's happening. Because okay. he's so uh, tense about the whole thing. He's so tense, yeah. And he, he cares just as much as me. And um, he... Uh, 
he's head down. I see him now, head down, he's to my left. And mm -hmm. going, well, oh, that's a shot. And Burley saved it again. <laughs> so there we go. And so I was off yeah. and running with a slightly higher pitch voice, I think, in those days. But And then Wokey <laughs> scored twice in the last 10 minutes and won 3 0. A clean sheet. A Wembley win and a trophy. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was really great. The three trophy finals in the 90s were also great, but the crowd was nothing like. There's nothing. You know, I think one was 12,000. Yeah. So, but in those days, I think it was live. The second half was live on BBC television on the Saturday afternoon. Yeah. I think, I, I don't think they were allowed to show the whole game because of fear that tickets wouldn't be sold. Yeah. So I think I think the whole game was covered, but the second half was was actually live, and um, it was live on the radio. And so, so it was a big event. There was the FA Cup final, and there's amateur cup final. And to be honest, apart from league football, there was no league cup, no European football. Well, it just started by fifty eight European. Football. Yeah. But there was no ancillary competitions of, of any value, really. So it stood proudly alone. There were, there were, in the 50s, there were some, um, have to get finals there, 100,000. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Filled Wembley. So 71,000, to be honest with you, Richard, I think at the time was seen as a bit of a, bit of a downgrade, really. <laughs> That's it, amazing. That yeah, is amazing. It, looks, it looks fantastic now. But I think if you, yeah to look at the gates in the previous years it probably and it was london it was a southeast based final we'd had bishop auckland yeah. and crook town and that you know bringing the two ends of the country together and so but it was great and it had a sad ending was i got home and i was shattered and my dad it was said just have a little sleep. I'll wake you up for the highlights. It's run in the evening. Mm -hmm. He didn't. Up. Oh no! Oh my God! <laughs> I'll let my son sleep. He didn't understand what it meant. So I didn't see anything of it until I went into television and managed to. You know, well before YouTube started, but I managed to get what was about. True, so we made a uh, when working had their big run in '91, and Kim Bazagla got a hat trick at West Brom. Um, there was a lot of interest there. And, there was an editor who worked um, in television who was a Woking fan and he had access to all this stuff. And we, we got video clips for all the players and sound recordings for all the players, um, which was a long time overdue. But yeah. we made sure everybody everybody got something out of it. And uh, he was wonderful. The, 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 when we put little trimmings on it and everything. So... So, yeah, but it is the game. I mean, people, so I wasn't at that, not obviously, but I wasn't at the World Cup final in 66, which is the proudest moment for English football. But um, the, uh, the 58 Amateur Cup final was special, and it all started that's four or five years earlier on a bus from Woodham <laughs> to Kingfield. And then I assume that was your first trip to Wembley. You hadn't been to see any England games or anything like that. I was first trip to Wembley, yeah. And, um, but not the last. <laughs> so, no, no. Uh, the old Wembley was very special. I did play there once um, oh, in, a yeah. team, in a team with Bobby Moore. It was before the, I think it was the Leyland Daft Trophy final or something. Bobby, oh, yes, Moore, yeah, yeah. Bobby Moore was in my team. We, play, we were Bolton and they were Torquay. Right. And the final score was 4-2. And I was walking off pretty thrilled about playing at Wembley. And I said to Bobby Moore, did you ever win an international here 4-2? <laughs> nice. And he, he did pause for a moment. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> that, it's, it's the circular nature of football. It always seems to come round. There's always a, a, a connection, which is fantastic. And, and you know, I think... Certainly for the younger generation, they would not understand the FA Amateur Cup. They they, they don't get it. I mean, the, I think the only exposure they get nowadays is obviously when you have a club like Maidstone, you have a fantastic run 
in the FA Cup. And they got, quite rightly, a lot of exposure. You know, beating Ipswich at Portman Road was pretty crazy. Um, and We lost I think two that's... at Dartford to Maidstone. Did you? In, in the Dart... FA Cup? Or... No, in yeah. the league. And Dow's got, okay. got the sack. Uh, right. I said, what about Kieran McKenna after the result? I think he had a, <laughs> a little yeah. bit more. And we, we lost at Maidstone. So oh, OK. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2-1, same as uh, Ipswich lost at home to them. But it is, it is different now. It is different because amateurism was part of life. Yeah. And playing for fun and... Obviously, gradually, more and more need for money came in and people wouldn't travel the length of the country to play on a Saturday unless they got some sort of reward, even if it was just in, the, it was in expenses, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it, 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 So I watched it from, I reckon, 53, no one got paid. And then by the time um, 58, others were getting paid, but Woking wouldn't have got paid. And I say, I think Woking, I, I was told off the record who Woking's first paid player was. And that was 1968. So, and then by, I say, I think it was 74, wasn't it, when it changed? Um, just as I was finishing, actually. <laughs> so I, I, you I, missed out on the riches. I did. I missed out on the riches. But that's what football was when you grow into it. It's your time, isn't it? The kids now, it's different. Of course, I respect that. And I'm not saying that it was better. It was just mm. just me and just the way it fell. And there are still people around like Mickey Stewart, who um, was with Corinthian Casuals when they got to the Wembley final. Um, I don't think played because of cricket commitments. Yeah. Um, lots of cricketers played for Corinthian Casuals, Doug Insole, people like that. I, mm. I played with uh, Graham Root played. A lot of Surrey players played. So there was a lot of overlap. With sport. I mean, sport was... It was a relaxation, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't another revenue stream for your your lifestyle. You wanted to go away and enjoy. Um, but there were big crowds, four or five thousand when I played my last game at Wickham. I think, yeah. I think their players were getting paid. Ours certainly weren't. Um, so yeah, it's just evolved, Richard. I, I, I say it's the right thing to do. Credit to the FA for recognising it. To be honest, they could have recognised it a little bit earlier. But the right thing has happened, and now everybody has to be registered. There are all sorts of complications. You can't sign a player from a Welsh club without getting international clearance and things like that. Is that um, true? Complicated, oh, yeah. So um, uh, it's it's moved on a pace. And non-league football is very well regulated now. Um, and But it's still exciting, and it's still the pyramid. And, and we've still got to cherish it. Yeah. And looking at Woking's development, because you say you've been a fan for this long and you've been through, you know, good and bad, like all fans do. But you, you touched on it when you said earlier that they won the FA Trophy three times in four years, I think it was, under Jeff Chappell. Um, and, and I think I'm right, in, I think I read, maybe it was in Donald McRae's interview recently, God, that when... You went when Woking went on the run, and they had Clive Walker was part of that, wasn't he? At some stage, when in the late nineties, I think you were asked to commentate on a couple of Woking games. Talk us about that, because that would be the first time that you were commentating on your own club's, you know, fortunes in a game. Yeah, I mean the um, the first time. I did uh, home to Barnet in the FA. I can look up the date because I've got the yeah. book here, which was when Jeff Chapel was manager. Yeah. Um, I turned down doing the um, Everton game and working, mm -hmm. having beat West Brom, were drawn at home to Everton. They switched it, which I, they wouldn't be allowed to do now. No, 22nd of November. 1994, mm -hmm. I um, what Woking had drawn four all at Barnet, and the replay was at Kingfield, and it, it was m my job to do it really. Um, and 
I could not have tried harder to be impartial. <laughs> Ray Clements was the manager of Barnet, a great oh, guy, yeah. a great goalkeeper, and a particularly kindly person. So I rang him up and said, look, I haven't got any footage really of the four all. Um, right. Game's on Wednesday. Can I come and watch you train? He knows I'm a working fan. Yeah. And, it, uh, and I said, Ray, I promise you, nothing that I learn here will pass my lips until it's appropriate on the air. Yeah. Are you right? I'll be there at 10 yeah. o'clock. So I went, I had chapter and verse on Barnet. When I arrived at the ground for the broadcast, Jeff Chappell, the aforementioned, who incidentally played in the game against me when I was playing for Corinthian Casuals against what, in 1971 uh, really? and, and wow. scored, uh, in fact, he constantly reminds me of. Um, <laughs> he said, Mark, Mark, uh, come and tell us what you know. And I went, Jeff, I cannot do that. I said, I will not do that. And I didn't say probably you shouldn't have asked, but I felt you shouldn't have asked. And um, so I went straight to the gantry and and did the commentary. I woke and did win the game, one nil. Mm -hmm. Nothing of any value to Jeff Chapel and the Woking team that day came from me. And I was I can understand why he asked, but uh, Ray, Ray Clements was Somebody you would not ever let down. And, uh, I didn't let him down. Yeah. Then I did, following year, the same sort of thing happened with um, Jimmy Nickel was manager of Millwall. Jimmy Nickel, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and working through, played them at home. And that was picked by television. I did it. Okay. It was a draw, 2 2, I think. Got yeah. the, I think you're right. I, I looked it up, yeah. Yeah. And so I was saying, oh, if you did the original one, you do the replay. Mm -hmm. So I went to the den and uh, with all the, the den entailed. And um, yes. five walkers scored, working 1-1 one, one now. And so that was that was very special. And um, But I, the only time you knew I was pleased was when I gave the final score. And I was then off the air within five seconds. <laughs> You're running round the ground. <laughs> uh, I should have been, shouldn't I? But uh, yeah, listen, a lot of a lot of commentators have favourites, and you know, I mentioned Alan Parry is a Wickham fan, but he, he's a Liverpool. Yeah. But uh, dear old Motti, I think Chelsea was his main team, although he worked a bit for Spurs, doing some of their yeah. voiceovers on their tours and things. I think he's a Chelsea man. Um, who else? Are, Ian Dark at Portsmouth, you know, he's yeah, of course, yeah. He's those games. So we're not robots, we're only human, but we do have a huge respect for the those who help us, you know, those who go out of their way to mark mm -hmm. us. I've had well, when did I start? Seventy four, I've had nearly fifty years of that kind of help. And if you blow it, then you don't get anymore the word gets around football's a very small industry really so you yeah. know don't risk talking to him so I've managed to keep that going but now it's a bit easier because the teams are announced 75 minutes before kickoff to us the commentators yeah. so really then you've got a specific question to go and ask why is he not playing or what mm -hmm. thinking behind that um, and I think that's sort of accepted because the teams are probably there. yeah um, I, there's a couple of other things I just wanted to touch on because clearly your commentary career has lasted quite a few decades. <clears throat> and I think I'm right in saying your first commentary was in December 1974 when you came in as a late replacement for Gerald Williams, who is a Palace fan, so is obviously a man with great taste. Um, and it was a second division game, Southampton, Sheffield Wednesday. Do you, do you remember Anything about that? I remember everything about it because there's a joke that used to go around the sky, which is you've done two games today, your first and your last. And, <laughs> uh, although the sky hadn't been invented then, I yeah. had that kind of feeling 
that that was it was it could be that because I had no experience. Mm. Um, I'd gone to London Weekend Television, a wonderful job behind the scenes, editorial assistant. Had to give up playing serious football to do it, but you know, I'd had a right crack at it, so it wasn't so much as I look back at it. Um, and uh, I was editing the goals together for On the Ball, the precursor to St. Greasy, yes. editing the matches together for the big match, working with Brian Moore, Bob Garden, who was the guy who gave me this chance in commentary, Vicky Davis, um, yeah. fantastic array of people behind the scenes, and um, one of whom, Jeff Fulser, is still working in television. He's uh, head of Sunset and Vine, one of the best production companies. He's um, he's he's just really seventy, so um, you know our generation. <laughs> I'm actually was sitting when he came back to his second spell as Chelsea manager. We'd known each other a fair while, and he mm. said, "You still here?" And I went, "You still here?" <laughs> and he nice. went, went, "They'll have to shoot us." <laughs> love that, love that. Um, really good so, um, yes, yeah, so uh, what actually happened was I was a bit frustrated not being at football grounds on Saturday afternoons. Yeah. So we had a system where we had every third weekend off. So I asked if one of these third weekends off, I could go to the match, which we covering for London weekend, and sit. I took my little portable tape recorder and a microphone, and I did Arsenal 2, Queen's Park Rangers 2, the Queen's Park Rangers of Bowles, the Arsenal yes. of Alec Ball, really. Um, right. And it was, it was, I saw the game the other day, actually, it was on the big match revisited. Right. And it was the day, anyway, so I just sat there, did it, and I thought, well, I never quite knew why I was doing it. I'd always listened to the commentaries when I was, working, I was editing them, and also when I was just watching in the 60s, a long time before um, I was in television, 50s and 60s. So uh, they gave me um, they gave me the opportunity to do that, then I played it back to Bob Gardham, who was the iconic big match director, and he went, mm, that's not bad. Um, let's have another go. Um Anyway, before I could have another go, the call came in. That was October, I think. The call came in from Southern Television. And yeah. I, was in the same, I was in the same office as Bob. And he looked at me, answering the phone, and then he turned away like this, way, right hand was away, and started to speak quietly. And I thought, honestly, I did sense at the time that this would be something that might involve me. <laughs> and um, it was and Southern said we need this we need somebody for a game I mean Jerry Williams was definitely a tennis commentator who yes. kept his voice in, in practice by doing a bit of football in the winter mm -hmm. um, so they said we've got to do another one so, so I did one that was recorded on videotape actually and it got sent. It was a West Ham game at Upton Park. Um, anyway, the, I came through. I got, I got the nod. I could do it. Right. Good. Saturday, Saturday December 28th. On Boxing Day, um, Southampton were playing at Portsmouth. I thought, well, I don't know these teams, but I'd better go and see one of them. And it's my well, Sheffield Wednesday were at home. So yeah. I thought it probably easier to go to Portsmouth. And I got a ticket, which for Portsmouth these Southampton games was pretty difficult, I think. Yes, must yeah. have been, I must have got a press, a press ticket. Mm -hmm. I think Southampton won 1 0. And uh, Sheffield Wednesday were obviously going to be a challenge. But I got really lucky, Richard. So I, I put myself into the same hotel that Sheffield Wednesday was staying in, thinking I might see him at breakfast. It's an right. old commentator trick. I wasn't an old commentator, but I knew enough. So yeah. the Polygon Hotel at Southampton, I went there and Steve Burtonshaw was the, oh, yeah. a bit confused with Keith Birkinshaw, Steve Burtonshaw worked yeah. for him, was manager at Sheffield Wednesday. And I introduced myself to him and said, look, is there any chance I can have a look at them at dinner? I said, I can do better than that. He said, we're training in the morning. You can come and watch. 
Well, on what, Saturday morning, before a game at three o'clock on a Saturday, yeah, and said, well, we need to stretch our legs, and I like to do that. So they went, I don't know if you've driven into Southampton very often, but the avenues, there's a sort of green space on the right hand side, you used to turn right, right at the end of it to the Dell, and the yeah. uh, Southampton Creek ground. So I followed them out there, and um, watched them, and it was great. I mean, I, I was so close to them. Uh, you know, it was it was really, and, and only 13, probably 13 players at most. Now, I look at a team, especially an international team, you've got 30. Yeah. You look at, um, so, um, anyway, I came back. And <laughs> this is a punchline, really. The first goal, which is always the test for a commentator, whether it's your first game or your thousand of the first, you know, into your rhythm. Scored in the second minute by Eric Potts, a gingerhead winger, the only gingerhead player on the pitch, and could not mistake him for anybody else. I just watched him train three hours earlier, so yeah. <laughs> I got the goal. And then Sheffield Wednesday, did, uh, they weren't doing very well. And Southampton were yeah. building a side that would win the FA Cup 18 months later in yes. Pacific, yeah. Um, when they beat Manchester United, Bobby Stokes. Bobby Stokes, Bobby Stokes, yeah. Mick Shannon, their big star, didn't play. He was injured. And um, they huffed and puffed, but they didn't score. It finished 1-0. So that was the mm-hmm. first game. And believe it or not, and I find this hard to believe, when I, every time I tell someone, Sheffield Wednesday didn't win another league game all season from really? December the 28th to April That's when amazing. the season finished. Wow. So they went down, I see. With the, didn't really yeah, they went the down from the second division to the third division, yeah. Colin Harvey so, played, I think. Uh, oh, he was he? obviously an outstanding oh, player. Yeah. yeah but mm. Ken Knighton played, I remember. Um, David Sunley. They were, they were quite... I, I'd done the names, mugging up on the names, but not seen yeah, yeah. Um Anyway, walking out of the car park, I met the match director who is not a football man um, but he's been he's a director and I found out later that his claim to fame was he directed the famous uh, show Sunday Night at the London Palladium oh yeah uh, which was big box office on ITV in the late 50s and so he was not so I had to do the game and then, like the big match, like Brian doing the big match, but not in vision. I had to do the links into the other games, you know? And yeah. say, coming up, so and so and so and so, pictures from Granada Television, commentator Gerald since that. Yeah. Something that I knew pretty well because I was editing those sort of stuff for a yeah. time previously. Things, yeah. so. so I was, I was well trained to do that. Anyway, so I was, um, Stephen Wade, the gentleman was called, and he was a gentleman. And he said, he came over. I said, ah. I said, I was like, okay. And he went, mm, yes, yes, well done. Well done, old boy, I think he said. That was another one. He said, um, we've got another game in a couple of weeks. Would you like to do that? And my punchline to that is, I've had people saying, we've got another game. Would you like to do that? Pretty much ever since. Yeah. Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily. Even yesterday, I got a message saying, can you do this? So, yeah, it's been great. It's been great. And that was that was a, an epic day, yeah, 53, 74, mm-hmm. 92. World Cup final in 82 for ITV with the wonderful Ian St. John. And it was a big, a big gig for somebody who'd only been doing it for less than eight years. You know? Absolutely. Um, up against Motti, and we had Greavesy on our panel. So we got a very good percentage. Yeah. Very good percentage, very high percentage of views because everybody loved Greavesy. And Ian was very, he was great to work with as well. So that was, um, yeah, those are the sort of dates that I remember. Yeah, going back, <clears throat> the ITV World Cup panel was a much more entertaining group of people than the BBC. This is in back of my mind. Because didn't they have Brian Clough at once and Derek Dugan and there were there was there was always a bit of which yeah. is what often you what you want from a little bit of friction. 
and a little bit of, you know, that's absolute tosh. This is what's happening. And I, I do, I always had this feeling that ITV had the better panel. Obviously, it had the better commentators because you were there, but um, <laughs> the panel, the panel as the backup was, was also pretty strong. When I, went, when I went in in 74, 73 to television, mm. um, uh, before the 74 commentary, of course, it was 74 World Cup. So I worked, yeah. I worked on that and I was yeah. through, through somebody leaving. I got to produce, be the producer and very much in quotes for Brian Moore with the scripts and what we needed and what we should say. And, oh, okay. and obviously it brought me in very close contact with the panel. Um, and uh, Malcolm Allison was another one, Paddy Creran, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're great people, all individuals, all with very strong opinions. And Paddy Crone, you've got Graham Sunash, you know, it's a, a kind of chip off the same block, really. Um, and it, it, it's that, that kind of don't, don't, um, don't sugar the pill, really. No, no, no. no. Tell it, tell it like it is. And they were, they were great. And Bobby Moncur was on it as well, who I got on very well with because he, mm-hmm. he was always on the late night shows because he was the junior. And we used to call it late night with Moncur. The, the, <laughs> I had to, I had to edit some of those and produce some of those. And uh, so we're still friends now. So it's, uh, it, it was, it was a great time. And, uh, I think the, um, what was so good was the fact that there hadn't been that much live television. So the World yeah. Cup, the cup finals, I worked on a lot of cup finals. I went on the team bus to five or six cup finals, which is a privilege yeah. on compare, really. I mean, to, to yeah. have walk on and I went with Fulham, I went with United, I went with Liverpool, I went with Spurs. I mean, to, to go to a cup final, I went with Southampton. That was yeah. in 76. To be in the team bus, get on the team bus with the players going to Wembley. It's beyond your wildest dreams, really. I didn't have my boots no, just the, <laughs> you know, Glenn Cockrell picked you once, so you must have thought mm, there's a chance here. Yes. Um, but as you say, that access, you can't imagine it now because you know it's a very controlled space. You know, the media people at clubs are much tighter on things. So the idea of a commentator or even a journalist going on the team coach is, I mean, they probably wouldn't have a coach anyway, but uh, it, it's just not going to happen, is it? It's just. It's, it's no, it occasionally happens. Jose Mourinho, bless him, allowed right. me to travel back from Newcastle with Chelsea. Oh, did uh, okay. It's a few years ago now, but he did. And because uh, I live near the Chelsea training ground, and yes, you know oh, he, yeah. that was that was that was very um, very generous of him. Did you sit with um, Jose we, we did, away? We didn't. We didn't uh, spend much time together on the journey. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. I was I was able to thank him, and uh, it it was a bit more complicated than we all set out for. But anyway, it, it, the thought was what counted, and it was a very very kind thought. Absolutely. And Harry Redknapp let me fly back from Teesside. That tells you that Teesside Airport has been closed for a long time mm. with Southampton. Um, okay. Very very kind as well. So, yeah. If you if you ask if people. People are a bit afraid to ask now, I think. Mm. Um, but maybe they have sympathy for the olders. And, I can say <laughs> on that. Well, but, let's hope that continues because I will consider myself an old as well. Um, probably one last question, actually, and it relates to, <clears throat> you told me, obviously, the background to your first TV commentary at Southampton, you know, and you had a couple of tests and you were there. But then... You know, you were the commentator on the first Sky live game at the City Ground in August 1992. Is that a is that a fresh memory? Is that something where you had certain things? I mean, quite often, I think for for these really key moments, it's sometimes the stuff on the periphery that people remember rather than the specifics of the game. How about for you for that particular match? I think it's. For me, it was um, it was the second Premier League game I did because I did Leeds versus Wimbledon the day before. Okay, so a lot of my parameters around the game were, was getting there from Leeds. 
Yeah. And getting organized for this historic event, although we didn't realize quite how historic it, it was going to be. Mm. Um, so my memories are more about the match. Um, well, again, like my first match, it was 1 0. At this time, to the yes. home team. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very recognizable goal scorer. I've got a big photo of it. This guy asked me to do um, a few years ago my uh, photo, a photo exhibition of my games that I've done. Yeah. He gave me one at the end. Which one do you want? Nice. And I picked the first one. And it's massive. I, I should be put, it should be up on a wall already, but it's in. <laughs> um, so. Um, no, I, I mean, anything involving um, Cluffy was always, always, you had to be on your toes. Yeah. Many, he was very kind to most people, but he knew when to draw the line, even if you didn't. Um, because right. yeah. it could be when you've got Peter Shilton ordered to make you a cup of tea, this is being put in to clean your shoes before you go home because they're on that red grass around the city ground. Yeah. Um, and and that sort of thing happens. You get it's in danger of being inflated. Your importance. And uh, I almost thought he invented reverse psychology before we ever mentioned it, because you can go back the next time and be kept waiting for an hour and a half. <laughs> in the <fire. laughs> yeah, of course. But he 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 um, he obviously I knew him and that helped. And uh, it was it was special. We felt like pioneers. And. Um, I think that's that's the way I like to remember it, really. Yeah. That many viewers, we knew the dishes. You could see them. Either they were there or they weren't, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I said it's a few times. We used to make train journeys to games. I mean, every time we went through a city, like Stoke, I can remember in particular, we'd look to see whether there were more dishes than the last time we went through it. You know? Right. And it was like that. It really was because it was a big leap of faith. To go yeah. into non, come out of terrestrial television to Champion TV, which was um, the British satellite broadcasting, mm -hmm. that was a big leap of faith, and it was a wrong because we only lasted six months, really. True, yeah. <laughs> then Sky moved in, took us over, so none of us had any idea whether we were going to be kept on or not. And but we were, thankfully, and. My gratitude has never left me about what Sky have done for me. Um, it's uh, made me appreciate the, the um, loyalty they showed me for decades. Absolutely. And as you say, you've got this massive picture of the goal. So I know you described it as a peach. And it was, it was a pretty good goal, wasn't it? Because Sheringham, uh, I think the next week, didn't he go to Spurs? Because they were sort of caught his last, then It was his last yeah. game before us, yeah. It's not a bad epitaph, is we, it? Just we, whack it into the cooler against Liverpool. I think he finished top scorer, didn't he? But with the Spurs, he did. Got yeah, plus, yeah, yeah, plus yeah, plus one for Forest. It was the plus one, you know. Yeah. Um, but we had we had a whisper that it was going to happen, but it it didn't infiltrate into the commentary. I don't think I can't. I've never seen the whole game back, but we did have a whisper it might happen. Right, I've got two more questions, and I'll let you go, Martin. Um, can you remember your first match as coach? Whether it was, you know, because obviously you've, you've done coaching at quite a few clubs now, uh, along with Alan Dowson. Uh, first as coach or first as coach of Woking, because Woking's your club and you got to yeah. become first team coach. Do they ring any bells? Actually, I was assistant manager of all these assistant things. Manager. Sorry, but, but it's, a, it's a moot point because... Doesn't really, doesn't really matter. <laughs> well, it's a moniker. I've I, I described me more as the oily rag, really. <laughs> I just looked after I'm this sure. guy. Really. I, the first first one with Dowse was at home to Bromley for Walton and Hershey. We lost. Right. Um, at the old stomp on ground, stomp on lane ground, which is no there anymore. And the first for Woking, I remember absolutely vividly because we won with a last minute penalty. Wow. Way to East Thurrock. Um okay. We were booed off at half time, our rival, yeah. and we were we conceded a corner in the last minute, and probably into injury time. Yeah, and we um, we were panicking about losing one nil, 
we cleared the corner and a young man called Reggie Young, who is now playing for Farnborough. We, we wanted to keep him at Woking, but he wants to play all the time. He didn't play that often. It's a very promising talent. He ran the length of the field and got brought down. And away from home, the referee gave us a penalty, which was going to be the last kick of the game. Another player has helped us a huge amount, Max Kretschmer. We had him at Hampton. Mm-hmm. And they're working. And he's a good penalty taker. So he stepped up and there's a picture photograph of me jumping in the air. Somebody caught it. It's oh, quite, really? quite a nice picture, actually. I'm quite quite proud of it. Um and as Max buried it, and we won one nil. And we were off and running. And that season, um with me making a, I must say, a, a very minor contribution, I promise. Um, we got to the third round of the FA Cup. Yeah. And we played Watford at home, which was live on, it's now TNT, BT. And we um, got promoted. The most thrilling part of my non league time, obviously, because it was working, was the semi final, the playoffs. Torquay won it. And they were in very sad to see there and big trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, they won the league and we had a great battle with Gary Johnson and. It's, it's, Good, good banter. And um, we're 2 0 down home to Wealdstone in the playoff right. semi final. Okay. Not, mu- not much more than 10 minutes to go. We had a Ferdinand in our team, Kane Ferdinand, who hadn't played much and played for a while. He, he was on the bench, so we sent him on. Then mm-hmm. he transformed the game, just he got us the ball. And it went 2-1, 2-2. And I said to Dallas, we've got to win this in, in time. We don't want to go to extra time. We're, we're on a real roll. And, um, yeah, Jake Hyde got a crash mark scored in that game as well. And Jake yeah. Hyde threw and uh, one-on-one with the goalkeeper. We always fancied him. And it is. It's on YouTube. You should watch it. It, it was full house, five and a half thousand at work. You know? And so that was that was a season. And then, of course, the pandemic came. And, and after that, it was... It was a bit sticky, really, for all sorts of reasons. But we did stay there. We kept them in the National League, but there were all sorts of restrictions going on. Um, One season, we couldn't get relegated. So we basically decided that we could cut the playing stuff. So we had a terrible run. I remember playing. We got a draw at Stockport. And uh, we put a young kid on at left back. And and the manager at Stockport at the time, they went up for six minutes. And, and, and it was six he went only six minutes, and I went. <laughs> and I, I will not say what I really said, but I said, "Yes, you had forty-six chances already, and you're complaining <laughs> about six minutes." And yeah. uh, we got the draw. So we've had some good. We won at Chesterfield, which is it was a big throw. We won at South End, um, yeah. Notts County four-one. We had some some wins over teams that I've commentated on with, you know, which. Which were very special, really. So it was, it was good. Um, Dallas left, and um, obviously that wasn't a nice time. And I didn't get back for about sixteen months, and he didn't go back for nearly two years. But we're back now, and um, one or two of the elements that were there that perhaps we didn't want to confront had gone. So we were able to resume our, in my case, love affair. Uh, he loves the club, really, Dallas, but um, yeah, can't show it. No. Excellent. Well, it's been an incredible journey, and I think when I'm when I'm looking at your connections with Woking, it I think unique is an overused word, but I think you have a unique relationship with this club, starting off as a fan in 1953 to your first match. I'm assuming you've been to hundreds of matches since. Then you commentated on them. You also played for them. You've also coached them. But I think the key is, and what not many people have in their locker, is you painted one of the stands. <laughs> and that's what marks you out as you, you, a unique you missed, fan. You missed out, played against them, which was... Uh, played against, At the yes, time, was a uh, was a... Uh, yeah, it probably had more resonance in the football calendar than when I played for the reserves. But what I didn't tell you, just to, and this is, yeah. 
really self-centered, so forgive me for uh, self no, no, no. I played 65 minutes of this game against Harrowborough, and I would have stayed on, but they'd made a plan, so they thought I would be right. cut off, I think. Anyway, someone was there to come on, and that was on the Wednesday. The following weekend was the end of the season, the weekend, 10 days' time, the end of the first team season. I was uh, slated to present the awards at the end of the season. So I went there and uh, player of the year, blah, 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 blah. And uh, at the end, Glenn came up and he was coming towards me up on the flint, the step by a stage, but I was oh, up, I elevated, elevated, yeah. And uh, I saw him coming towards me. I thought, oh, I've got a woking tie. I don't know what he's going to need to give me another tie. And he came up and he presented me with a Capital League winner's plaque because Woking Reserves wow. won the Capital League. And right. so not only did I play for Woking, I won a trophy with them. And because I played a game, I was entitled. I think what really happened is most of the other reserve team players had left and gone off. But there's <laughs> so there were a few spare. So there was yeah. one or two spare. But I'm very proud of it. That I, and I've kept the form I had to sign to be played. I had to go through the FA to. So you know, when you think what I've been through with Woking, that was um, that was something that I never thought I would get. <laughs> and I yeah. at least still have in the room behind me. <laughs> you need a, a trophy cabinet, clearly, for your own uh, stuff. So, yeah, no, it, it's been fantastic. And, and I know you keep quite a lot of stuff, so you've got a memorabilia, you've got stats, you've got books, and, and you've got the programme from that original game, which which is amazing. Did, did you manage to get the programme for the FA Amateur Cup final in 1958? You've got that as well. Because I actually tracked it down. Because I was going to buy it and then give it to you. And I've only just tracked it down. But if you've already got it, then there's not much point in getting another one. No, it's I've made a point. It was very kind thought, Richard, by the way. But um, I've I've tried to get all the programmes from the 50s and up to 68, really. Because in 68, I started to play in a league which working were in against them. So, yeah. uh, I've, um, but I did keep the, um, the November, the whatever it was, 1971 one, and I produced it on a WhatsApp message to people who didn't believe that Brian Finn and I played against each other, and it quite uh, two pretty concise names, B Finn, M Tyler, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, and Woking have been great to me. Um, whether I'll see them get in the football league, probably not. Do I really want them to get in the football league? Only maybe, um, because for a long time, Woking had the proud reputation of being one of the best non-league teams in the country. Never going to be one of the best league teams in the country. Okay. So um, maybe, maybe knowing where you where you belong is part of the but the, the owners who are investing heavily in the team. Um, mm. They've clearly got the ambition of getting the league, and good luck to them. You know, it's another phase, like you talked about youngsters um, today, not thinking, well, they won't think about all the history and being a good non league team. They just want to go up onwards and upwards, and you've got to have ambition. And they're showing ambition, which makes it a pleasure to visit the club. Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, I. I recorded a, a pod with Jim White yesterday, and he actually went, he's a Man United fan, but he went, his first game was Altrincham against Barrow. And Altrincham, for me, are the sort of northern version of Woking in that they've never been in the league, but they're always, you know, vying for it. And they have a lot of FA Cup ticks. Good, I mean, Altrincham good cup looks, amazing, yeah. amazing. Uh, knocked out 17 league clubs, which is pretty extraordinary. But as you say, in a way, sometimes you have to know your place and maybe that's it without losing any ambition. But I certainly know my place. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and talking to you about all those memories which have come flooding back for you and they're fresh for me, which has, has been fantastic. So I do really appreciate your time today, Martin. 